Aloha mai kako, and welcome everyone to our Pacifica webinar series. The Pacifica webinar series is a continuation of the Pacifica Scholar Summer Institute that bridges culture, community, and education through Talanoa and intends to amplify our Pacifica community's voices as well as provide resources for higher education at the University of Utah. This Zoom webinar will be moderated, recorded, and offered later on our YouTube channel, the Pacifica Archive. Special thanks to Dr. Kehaulani Vaughn, our faculty advisor, Moana Uluave Hafoka, our bridge program director, Kaimana Kahale, and Kalei Tuitupo for bringing this webinar into all of our living rooms. Welcome. We're so excited that all of you are here to join us for this evening's Pacifico webinar series. Um, as you may all know, I'm Juan Oluave Hafoka and have been hosting the series for the past uh, few months. Tonight, we're excited that we'll be having a guest moderator, um, Kaimana Kahale, who is our Pacifica graduate assistant um, researcher here at the University of Utah. Um, our our outline for our agenda will be remain the same with an hour and a half uh, format, beginning with our panel discussion. And everyone, um, we will end with the Q&A. So if you have any questions that you may want to ask the panelists, please write them in um, below your screen. There's a button for, for Q&A and we'll take those at the end. So I'd like to introduce Kaimana Kahale, our guest moderator. He's our, as I said, our Pacifica graduate research assistant who is in his first year of the master's program in education, culture, and society. He's a re resident of Molokai, Hawaii, and is happy to bring his ohana to our Talanoa session this evening. Thank you so much, um, Mana, and I'll turn the time over to you. Awesome, thank you, Moana. Um... And thank you all for joining us today in our most recent episode of the Pacifica webinar series. Uh, so what I'll do is I'll introduce our various speakers today before we jump into kind of the meat of our discussion. Uh, to start off, our first speaker uh, is Michiela Pescaya, and Michiela is a wife, a mother, a mentor, a storyteller with a story, an artist, an advocate, a believer, a dreamer, a doer, a caretaker, an Aina lover, a Chinese Filipino Hawaiian descendant of brilliant ancestors and a proud part of the Molokai community. She also has done some work as a park ranger at the National Park Service at Kalaupapa National Historical Park. Our next speaker is, our next speaker is uh, Auntie Penny Martin and uh, Penny was born and raised on Molokai, uh, is also a Native Hawaiian practitioner who has worked for the Maui AIDS Foundation as well as the Moana Lua Gardens Foundation uh, for nearly 20 years. She's done some schooling at Kanakakai, Kamehameha, uh, a few years at Hastings College in Nebraska, as well as the Molokai Education Center. Uh, she currently works for Papahana Kuaola um, and continuing culturally based environmental education. Um, she's also a part of the voyaging community for about 45 years and she sells both on the va'a and in the classroom. Uh, she credits great mentors, her ohana, school, village, va'a, uh, nonprofits for the life lessons that have inspired her work. And uh, finally, our last guest speaker is Kekama Helm and Kekama is a Native Hawaiian community member who lives on the island of Molokai where he was raised all his life. He has three children, two boys, one girl, uh, Kekama loves to spend time with his ohana, listen to pl and play music, uh, be in the ocean, plant trees. Uh, he currently works as a youth development specialist for the Liliokalani Trust and is also a part of the ohana va'a. Molokai is his home. Uh, so with that being said, I want to thank all of our panelists uh, for coming today um, and joining us. Um, thank you, folks. Um, and we'll jump right into the discussion. Um, how's everybody doing? How's, how's, okay, awesome. Um, so before, before we begin, I just wanted to say thank you folks for coming on. Um, you know, this is a great opportunity, I think, to bridge these two communities that are separated by the Mahona, by the ocean. Um, obviously our own community is on both sides, but um, so, 
with that being said, I'm going to start off with our first and probably our most important question. And that is, what is your favorite Pacific Islander band or artist? And uh, yeah, we always start off with this one. And I think it's the most important <laughs> one. Let's, let's start with um, Uncle Kikama. All right. Oh, you don't <laughs> mind that's why. Kaiwala, um, that is an awesome question. And you know, we were, me and Mickey was talking about it and we're gonna go outside of Hawaii because if we were to do Hawaii, there's so many yeah. bands. I mean, but I, and, and TBK and I do have the same band in mind, but um, one of my favorite bands is the band Herbs from Aotearoa. Mm, I've, I've never heard of them. What, what kind of genre is it? Uh, I don't, I don't really they, know. They old school reggae kind of based, but they like from the seventies and eighties yeah. and plenty bands today remake their music. Yeah. Whoa. Like, yeah, they're like, they, they back there, <laughs> but, uh, I think we're in agreement that of, of the more influential, uh, Pacific Island music for us, Te Vaka. Tevaka, I think, resonates with us and has been for a long time. Um, and they've actually come to Molokai and performed live in front I, of our I missed it. At our library <laughs> for the community. And that was super fun. Um, and then another band that comes and plays for us quite often is Catch a Fire. So I think for us, part of it is the exposure. So if you come and play in our backyard, then awesome. But really, really, we, we do enjoy a lot of music from not I don't say non-name bands but like we get so many Tahitian paddlers that come up and when the whole entourage come um or when the va'a our sailing brothers and sisters come through on the canoes there's always music happening and so we just get to enjoy like how we enjoy music and that's backyard family style just party and sing and sing and sing and sing and um, put our own spin and we translate songs into each other's languages and carry the same tune or make up our own words. And so I think um, we that's the funnest part for us is when all the cousins from all the Pacific Islands get together and we just jam. Yeah, Auntie Penny, what you think? Auntie, I think you're muted. Got it. I am. Um... I too had a hard time because there's so many Hawaiian bands, you know, I went all the way back to Kahuana Lake Trio. Love them, love them. And then I was thinking of Country Comfort and Kalapana and the Gabi Pahine band with Rai Kudo, and that's one of my favorites. And who oh, had so many. And I also thought about when I went to Aotearoa and got to see Adija and Brother Love joined them. I love Brother Love. He's awesome. So I love Brother Love, but there are just too many. I, I just love Pacific Island, um, Pacific Island music in all the genres, and um, and I love it. You know, I love the music that my mom used to listen to, Red Souls in the Sunset. You know, it takes me back to Under the Mango Tree with all the aunties and Kani Kapila, and I love our Kalamula band. You know, <laughs> so yeah, they're just to me. That was a great question. It took me back to a lot of um, good memories and good music that I didn't think about for a really long time. And another music. They, well, you, you said band, so I was thinking, oh, they not really want band, and I was thinking maybe I'm gonna keep disappearing in this the kind. I'm just a hand talking over there on the screen. Um, they don't want band because I think they need instruments, but I love um, Cook Island choral singing at church on Sundays. Yes. Tahitian, Tahitian and Cook Island, um, that choral music that comes like Sunday, just yeah. like all over. It's so beautiful. And so it might not yes. be band, but definitely something that resonates with me. As, um, yes. When we, went, when we went to Tahiti and we went to church, the Himeni is yeah. so awesome. Chicken skin. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you folks for sharing. And, uh, you know, we'd like to start off with this question, not only to kind of get a feel of, uh, you know, where you guys are and maybe your research in, or your music interests, but, uh, you know, also we kind of joke around and say like, it gives us an indication of the age difference, right? You know, some of our younger panelists in the past have said, oh, you know, we love Kolohe Kai and, you know, some of these more popular modern, like um, reggae, Pacific Islander bands. And then, you know, there's other older folks who 
hark back to um, some of these pioneer musicians within the Pacific. So thank you folks. Um, but now with that question over, uh, let's jump into our discussion. Um, so, you know, obviously you folks are all products of this community here on Molokai, uh, but to many people, especially um, not from Hawaii and living in the mainland or other parts of the Pacific, um, you know, they may not know what or where Molokai is. Um, so my next question to you folks, and let's start with Auntie Penny since we started with Okikama and Auntie Mikiala, but what is Molokai to you and how would you describe it to someone who may have never heard it? That is a loaded question. Um, what is Molokai to me? Molokai is everything to me. Molokai is home. It's um, all my best memories are here. Um, all my chicken skin, feel good moments, you know, go back to Molokai. Um, Molokai, I don't know if people realize, Molokai is only 10 miles wide and 20 miles long. And it's in the middle of all the main Hawaiian islands. And, I, and I'm always surprised about that because um, I'm surprised that we're not more affected by, you know, the development and the tourism because we're like in the middle of it all, you know. But I think it's, it's because Molokai um, people work hard at um, keeping what we have, you know. We work hard at keeping Molokai Molokai because we love it just the way it is and we love our lifestyle here and it's important to us. Um, Molokai is like one big community. Everybody knows everybody and yeah, we have our little scraps among each other. You know, we don't always agree, but I think in the end, we know that that we can catch each other's back. We know that we can count on each other in the end, that we can come together and hug it up and be there for each other. Um, stupid friend. So yeah, that's what Molokai is to me. It's it's where my my roots are. You know, I live here in Kalamulu, where my my with coconut trees that my tutu planted, and um, this is where this is my tutu's homestead. This is where my mom and then grew up. This is where I grew up. This is where my kids grew up. It um, it gives me a sense of place and a and a sense of continuance, you know. So and then and every time when I thought about this, every time that I have had a challenge in my life or a hardship or something that I had to work out or deal with or if I was sick um, spiritually or, or physically, I would come here. I would come home because this is my healing place. This is where I can heal and I can get better. Okay. Um. For me, like like Eddie Benny said, Molokai is home. Um, it, it's where I'm gonna set my roots, where I raise my children. Molokai is also I don't know how to put it, like my teacher, in a sense. Mm -hmm. The island teaches me a lot. Um, teaches me how to slow down, how to observe. Um, Know how to how to how to take in all the good things and how how to live together. So I believe Thailand is also my teacher and has taught me a lot. Yeah. And and taught our families a lot. Um, that's what this place is for me. I I really 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 love this island, and this is where I'm going. Um, be here forever. Yeah, and that comes from our kuleana. I think it really does make a difference when you can say that your, your family's bones are buried in this land and to know that you have that kind of genealogical connection to the aina, um, it means a lot to us. And there are so many people that are living in spaces where they cannot say that. And we know that that's an ache. There's a, there's a, a sadness. So, so we take that as a privilege, or I do, that it's an honor, a privilege, and a responsibility um, to malama this place, to take care of this place because, because of that, because our mana is in this ground. And I have a duty to 
bring out the best of myself, my children, my family, my community, so that we can malama this place for the next generation. And always leaving that option of agency in a sense, like what you like doing Molokai when your turn, I gotta trust, I gotta trust you guys. <laughs> and so if I don't want, I one day I'm not gonna be here. So I gotta make sure that um, I, bring forward all the values, all the aloha, all the wisdom that was trusted to me from the generations before, I gotta make sure I'm paying attention and I'm giving that to the next generation because I want them to be happy, be healthy and be safe. And we in one position, especially with this pandemic, like when we look around at all the blessings we enjoy on Molokai, it's not by chance. It's because very intentional with the way our kupuna took care of this place and when set us up um, that if we really come down to it like we're not gonna starve we're gonna be all right we're gonna take care of each other and you know relationships and resources they all take management active management you don't just sit back and expect things to happen right so um, I think for that my answer would be like legacy and knowing that you're part of something and that something is um, does it doesn't exist for everybody everywhere. So don't take it for granted, for sure. Yeah, thank you, folks. Um, you know, I think you guys touched on a lot of different things in that question. Um, obviously, this idea of adhering to the lessons and the mo'olelos and the teachings of kupuna, you know, ideas of sustainability, how Molokai is a place of healing and a place of just, you know, inner pride, right? And, and just feeling proud of being from this place. Um, and kind of harking back onto some of those things, my, I guess my next question is, how are you folks uh, as members of this community engaging or, or teaching um, these types of things with others or with Keiki? Um, how are you, you know, teaching, I guess, this inner pride or adhering to a lot of these things that our Kupuna have, has taught us or sustainability and resourcefulness? Um, so we started with Auntie Penny, I'm going to start with Uncle Kikama this time. We'll just go back and forth. <laughs> okay, well, um, I think for me, it, it's part of, part of my, my, my job in, at the Lili Uokalani Trust is to, to uh, give our kids tools to, to um, not just to survive in this world, but the tools to be culturally grounded and and grounded in their community. Um, outside of work, I think it is also um, my kuleana as a father, as maybe a coach, um, to also teach those values that we've learned. And those values are values like Aloha and malama kekahi ikekahi, or take care of one another, and and aloha not just for for others, but for the land and for yourself. Um, so it is a, a kuleana and a privilege to be able to to teach that to the next generation. I think we do it um, one because we have to, but also because we love we love to, and that is our our aloha for the next generation too. Um, yeah, I mean, in a nutshell, that's that's my thoughts for now. Um, working off of that, I can say, you know, culturally, if you look back through history, our landscapes didn't really change all that quickly. Evolution was really slow. And so we, our kupuna did very small incremental adjustments to life and they paid attention and they recorded information and they passed it down and passed it down. And within the last even 50 years, maybe, especially, we went warp speed with how we're connected to the world and what kind of influence is coming from outside and affecting our children. So before, when I was growing up, you wanted to know something, you asked your mom and dad, you asked your tutus, your grandparents, you went to the encyclopedia, and then you turn on the news and PBS. What is that? And then the library. <laughs> yeah, like we, you would ask somebody smart for the answer. And nowadays, 
our kids not asking us. They pick up their phone because they all this information. They Google everything. They're looking on YouTube, how for hunt, how for fish, how for play music, how to do all kinds of stuff because so convenient. When they like home, they don't need wait for to, to say, oh, do your chores and then I will sit down with you and then I will tell you, you know, like they didn't have to, I mean, it's just a whole different context of learning now. Um, and so I think for me, it's intentionally creating opportunities for our youth to learn in one style that is more traditional because they every the world has everything else down like really if they like learn content it's out there at your fingertips instantly at all hours of the day yeah, well, not bad. but the values and the the everything else that goes with it yeah the the, the youtube video can teach you how for fish but how for pick which one, like when you're out in a field and you're going to decide whether to leave that one, take that one, or um, how much is enough, or like really studying the ocean and keeping yourself safe. The YouTube video is not going to tell you whether that set is rolling in and going to give you cracks or not. It, it's not there. And so we're seeing people running into trouble with the application of certain things. Yeah. And that kind of wisdom, we got to keep reminding our youth. It re you have to rely on your elders. You have to come back to this community. And so I think sometimes us as adults, we're feeling displaced. Like, because they don't ask us as often as we used to ask our elders. And so sometimes we feel like um, we don't have that authority anymore. And maybe we shouldn't say, and maybe we shouldn't scold. And you know, things are shifting. Before you went, you try act up in public. Um, everybody was on you. <laughs> like the whole, all the aunties, uncles, everybody at the party is gonna quick to scold you and turn you in and tell you, you know, and either they're gonna tell you or they're gonna tell your mom or your dad and your tutu, and they're gonna you're gonna get lickings at home, yeah. <laughs> and now people, you kind of say certain things or um, some of the filters aren't there anymore. It's handled differently. Now it's social media. People feel really brave or what they say to each other. And there's a lot of aloha disappearing in those spaces. Um, while there, there is more opportunity to love in some spaces, I also see the harm and detriment people can cause one another. Because our words, we don't need, we're not face to face anymore. We, at, you know, typing all kinds of stuff that we actually wouldn't give breath to if you was in my face. Yeah. So um, it's, those are just like the top of my list of things I'm mindful of when um, working with youth. And so even though I, I can teach in different, um, doesn't matter what I'm teaching, I guess, is what I say. That's the sentiment that I keep in mind. And depending? So, you know, I, when you asked this question, I went back to the Ulala no Eyao that, you know, one can learn from many sources, right? All knowledge is not taught in the same uh, schools. And, and, and I take every, every moment, every action as an educational moment, you know, as there's always something to teach, something to learn all the time. No matter what you're doing, you're cooking, you know, you're... you're yeah, yeah. Niece comes over and says, "Oh, Auntie, you make making tutus too. You put this. In. That's an educational moment, you know." Or we go, I go coach paddling, and you know, the ones that are new, they're like, "Oh, what is this thing called? That thing is called one ama, you know." So we start talking about all the different parts of the canoe, and so you have to grasp those um, educational opportunities and and take that time to push forward that education. And, you know, I'm very fortunate to be working for a nonprofit that brings culture into our education and, you know, and, and part of what we use as an educational tool is mo'olelo. And so I like to make sure that, you know, when I'm sharing mo'olelo, I include the stories of Molokai and use those mo'olelo to teach about Molokai. And, and I also like to um, use our Molokai people to to as a tool to teach um, our keiki about how how to have good values and how to behave and 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 show them their worth you know and one of my favorite things i like to teach about is george helm he's a molokai hero and i use him as an example you know i 
you know, I mean, Kanka Kai School, I tell the kids, hey, they went Kanka, here Kanka Kai School, you know, you know, the bus with Auntie Penny. So you, you cannot tell me that you cannot do this because you can, because look, he did it, you know, and look what he did. And he's a true Molokai hero. So I look for heroes from our own Aina and celebrate them and use it to, to rise up the, the children. I, um, oh, what was I was going to say, I, 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 I love it um, when they ask questions and, and, you know, and I take the time to answer them. I try not to put them aside for later because if they're asking, that's such a great thing. And, you know, Michaela was saying, talking about how we're not, we're not scolding the kids now. We, we, you know, we don't feel like comfortable to, that's a good part about being older, Mikiala. Like, I don't care how old I would tell them. Um, you know, when we had the luau at the yacht club, putin can come at them. You guys, canoes always take gas, you know? Everybody's always walking on them, um, uh, making any kind. And I don't have a problem stepping away from that party and going over there and telling them, hey, what you guys doing? And sometimes, you know, the parents, they give me stink. I like, what, you scolding my kid? And I look right back at them and tell yeah, because you never, because you never do your kuleana. Now, now it has become my kuleana, you know? And yes, I, I'm going to go to that. I'm going to go there and make you guys feel uncomfortable. And because, you know, I, I, I think I, because I have to, you know, because that's what I'm supposed to do. And if we don't, then how are you going to learn, right? And yeah, so education, every opportunity that I have in work, in my own home, or like he kind of said, when we're coaching or if we're out somewhere, I feel like if it is my kuleana, then I'm going to take that opportunity to do it. Thank you all for your responses. I mean, just a lot of unpacking what you folks have talked about, right? Obviously, scolding out of tough love and, and trying to remember these traditional ways of, of learning and teaching. And, and, and Auntie Michaela, you brought up a great point of how you know, in today's day and age, information is right at your fingertips um, and how that can have some good things, but also some bad things. And I, I kind of want to jump on that and hear your folks' thought, um, thoughts on this, because obviously we're in the midst of a pandemic. And, you know, even with this, we're transitioning to doing things online. But like you said, you know, you cannot learn how to dive or you cannot learn how to fish or do these these practices just from YouTube or online. Right. These are like lived embodied things you need to learn by doing. And, and listening and, and hearing to teachings, right? Um, so I'm just wondering, uh, how has kind of COVID um, changed or made things um, either difficult or how, I guess my question is, how has COVID um, made education and what you folks do either different or difficult or however? Does that make sense? And uh, we can start off with Auntie Mikiala if he wants to go. <laughs> All right. Um, it really has affected all of us. I think a lot of our direct services, our direct interactions have been limited. Um, and not because we are afraid that we cannot come up with ways to make it safe, but I think the government and whoever is liable, they are the ones who are more worried. Um, I think we could figure it out. And I'm going to give one example. Um, in our community, we celebrate um, our harvest season uh, with activities surrounding what we call makahiki. And every year, all the school children, we all gather um, down at the park and we have this whole day of competitions and food and music and celebration. And really it's, though it has a lot of, there's a lot of stuff connected to it. The main point of it is um, being thankful for the abundance that it makes Molokai Aina Momona, makes it um, healthy and happy. And so at the very you know, surface level, it's taking a moment to teach our children, no matter what your ethnic background, no matter where you live, we're gonna take a moment and just be thankful for the blessings of your community. And we weren't able to do that this year. And it's something that the school is right into the curriculum. PE is all about the sports and the games. Like they, they prepare and they use that cultural activity as their curriculum for physical education. 
um, culture, write English, like language arts, they're writing about these essays, they're doing art about this, they're doing science, con you know, uh, connected to the plants, because that's part of makahiki, everything is tied into makahiki, okay, now we, pandemic, and we gotta take that away, and almost like we had to shift, and kids are at home, and the teachers cannot do these activities anymore, and now we have to rewrite curriculum, and, and, figure it out. And so as community um, resources, we had to do smaller um, in-person or smaller or sort of in Zoom kind uh, interactions, still trying to share mo'olelo and the history and still trying to teach and be supplemental. Um, and then we came up with a, a, a plan where we walked one, the entire end of, uh, length of our island and we went to each school and we took, we broke the one piece of the festivities and we gave each family and each student the opportunity to engage so basically we took we made house calls <laughs> and we had people in each district come and participate and walk with us and uh, recite the place names and still be able to give their off their ho'okupu and show their appreciation um but in a smaller you know safer um level than the mass you know 1,000, 2,000 people all together. We did it um, in a way that still met all the government requirements. But yet, I tell you, in the middle of the pandemic, it brought some sense of normalcy to our, our community. That was something that they felt like they was losing so many, so many liberties, so many privileges, and just not, you know, something simple like that, just having this, um, entourage go by and, and recognizing people and recognizing the land, um, it gave teachers a different way to engage. And so I think those that's one example of how we think outside of the box now. What about you guys? You guys took everything online. It's Penny, you wanna go or? I, um, I was gonna say, you know, my job takes me to all four elementary schools throughout the school year and we do activities. I take them on huaka'i, you know, we go hola hola up to the forest, to the beach, um, to wetlands, you know, watersheds. So yeah, it was different for me this year that I couldn't haul all my kids on a bus or full drive trucks and take them outside. And so we had to, you know, we, we write our curriculum. We did virtual huaka'i instead of um, real time huaka'i. Um, so, and it was a challenge to me too, because when it comes to technology, I'm really the Wilma Flintstone in on our staff. You know, I I didn't um, when I started working for this organization. It wasn't with computers, and I had to learn along the way if I wanted to keep my job right. And so I just kind of stumble along and learn enough to to stay. You know, so it was a real challenge for me, but. Um, we worked it out, and the other the other side of that is I'm able to reach more students all at once because we go, you know, online. And so, like, you know, I have this uh, reading program, and on Mondays and Thursdays and Fridays, and when I read, I read to both Kilohana School and Manolo School at the same time. Whereas, you know, in the past, I would have had to go drive East End and then drive West End and do them on separate days and. I know I can do it all at once. So there's some pluses and and minuses to um, the COVID, yeah, um, situation. Um, but I'm I I'm thinking that you know I like what I'm glad that Mikiala mentioned the uh, makahiki, and actually Mikiala it brought back that element of that cultural element of marching lono throughout the island, and it's something that we don't always do. And so we were able to experience that element of makahiki that we may have forgotten and that we don't always do, right? We brought that back. And that was, I, I must say that we participated in it, in Kalamula. And you're right, it really brought some normalcy back and it uh, really was fun to celebrate that. Awesome. Thanks, Adipen. Um, for, you know, for us, for me, um, kind of was twofold. All of my programs for work went virtual. And like Andy Penny, we were able to reach, you know, um, kind of an exponential amount of kids, you know, as compared to what we were doing before. Um, we even bought in Andy Penny into 
to do some Mo'olelo via uh, Google Earth, yeah, and Google Maps. That was good fun. <laughs> yeah, that was good fun. So, you know, we were able to take those kind of things, and because Auntie Penny did it with us, we're able to take it into the classroom and do um, different programs, scavenger hunts or stuff via Google Earth and Google Maps, and where they would learn about places on the island. Yeah. So we were able to do that. And then when you get something like the walk with Makahiki that goes, does it, literally does it, you know, throughout the island, the Opio can kind of, you know, take what they would learn or look what they was learning and then see all these um, ohana of theirs walking to different ahupua'a, they make the connections, yeah? So it was, it was um, to me, COVID had blessings and then also, also your, your negative side where you were closed out to the broader community. Um, on a personal level, I got to spend a lot of time with my own family. And, you know, it made me really think like, I go to work eight hours a day and then I come home and then I get my kids for so many hours. Who's teaching my keiki, right? So on a personal level, COVID allowed me to spend a lot more time with my keiki. And I think, I hope that they <laughs> learned a lot more from their daddy in the past year than they have. Right, I, I I was able to teach my kid, my oldest, how to throw net. I was able to teach him, um, you know, how to plant trees, and they got to clean yard a lot. So, <laughs> <laughs> you know, that those values of Kuleana to where they live, right, and and how to malama their their own backyard. So it was a blessing, also. Yeah, I think though the virtual experience though has to be. I mean, it's for the now. And maybe moving forward after pandemic, there are some things that we're going to keep definitely because we got good at using it as a tool, but um, we cannot wait till we get our keiki back out experiencing things with all their senses and really, uh, you know, like we can take them on on visual, you know, maybe we can get them to hear something, but we want them to smell it and feel the, the pressure, the, the, the humidity on their skin and like take things in with you know, multiple senses. And I think all of us agree that the, the, the hardest part has been um, not being able to hug our students. The, uh, the other, well, the other thing I think about the technology is um, it's enabled me to, to keep my relationship that I established with my schools and my students and my teachers, you know, the, you didn't have that, um, that moment, that span of absence, you know, we stay connected, even though it's virtually, we stay connected and we kept that relationship going. So, you know, when I, when I zoom in with the kids to do the reading, you go, eh, how's it, man? Like, eh, today, how's it? You know, like, it's, you know, it's still the same. So we were able to keep that relationship going. And yeah, so I'm grateful for that. Yeah, and then when we see, because we sometimes see them in public, like at the store or at the post office, right? and it has been kind of, um, mina mina, I don't know what the word is, like when you see them and you want to hug them, and then we're all looking at each other, it's like the parent, you know, every we're just figuring out like what is okay and not okay, and how <laughs> that, that, I know I would be a, I would be a friendly market, you know, and this little kid would come out and just wrap herself around my leg, right? And we're like, and yeah, like, oh, oh, and or now when I go friendly market, I see the kids, they just kind of follow me around the store and like, <laughs> like that. So yeah, it's, it's different, but I, you know, this is the one time I think I'm grateful for uh, technology. Well, awesome. Mahalo for your folks' thoughts and, and you know, things you shared about this. I know this is a, it's a really crazy time we're living in, right? Um, and I think we're very fortunate to live in a, uh, in a small, you know, tight-knit community where, where we can still have a lot of these types of practices and interactions. Um, you know, still adhering to these governmental stuff, but, uh, you know, at the same time, um, we're fortunate that we were able to do some of these types of stuff. And then also, you know, have younger brothers and cousins and siblings clean yard and do chores, right? Uh, you know, that's what I've been doing too. <laughs> but anyways, um, you know, kind of jumping on this question, um, 
you know, I think we're in the month of, Mar uh, the, the month of March, um, only the third month, even though it seems like it's going really fast, um, at least in my case. But my next question is, is you know, we're, we're still relatively early on in the year. And I'm wondering um, what you folks are kind of looking at or looking towards um, for the rest of the year, whether that be engaging with our community, whether that just be personally, um, you know, like I said, this, this past year has been crazy and a lot of people want to just kind of move forward and see some good things and see some normalcy again so um i'm just going to open up to folks what do you folks are what are you folks looking forward to now that things are starting to get a little bit more normal again um shots that, that's a good question um i think for for me i'm I'm kind of looking forward to like a, a hybrid kind of, um, you know, you still using the, the technology to to reach out to to Keiki, but also, like Mickey said, like filling in those other senses, you know, the taste, the smell, those other senses for those Keiki. I look forward to that. You know, I look forward to 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 being in person so that we could we can fill in those senses for our Keiki. Um, I also look forward to, um, hopefully, you know, being able to, to, uh, hug your friends and, and, you know, really like show aloha to them. And I know we, we do, we do what we do out of aloha for our ohana and our friends and families. You know, we, we try to keep our distances or in our own bubbles because we aloha each other. Um, but, you know, I, I look forward to, you know, that coming and, and I think I look forward to also, um, our kids being able to, to learn much, much more because of what we have learned in regards to technology and, and reaching out to our keiki and being able to reach more kids, um, via Zoom, via Google. Um, you know, and and touching as much kids as we can, but also also linking up those other senses with them. Yeah, so it's kind of what I'm looking forward to. Can I wait? Um, I'm looking forward to. We have a really good thing going on right now with my school program, and it's been really fun and exciting. We're doing a lot of um, planting of native plants, sharing more lelo. Um, doing some science, but um, so I'm looking forward to to finishing off the rest of the school year. And we just yesterday had conversation about the summer program. And um, I'm I'm with Kekama. I'm looking forward to kind of a hybrid situation where I can do a little bit more live with you know small groups and um, that kind of thing. I don't want to. What I don't want to see happen is that we get too comfortable and too careless and jump the gun and then go backwards. So um, I am looking forward to to doing more things live with, with smaller groups, hybrid situation, but I also want to move forward um, cautiously and safely as well. Um, I'm looking forward to seeing my one and only Moapuna whom I've only seen like maybe twice since she was born. Um, looking forward to that. Yeah, but like I said, in a, in a safe and cautious way. So we already are having conversation about the summer programs and doing more things outside, you know, which is where our, I think our Keiki do the best when all their senses are engaged, yeah? It's just in their DNA. <laughs> I don't have too much to add to that. Um... We just got to keep being as open-minded and creative as possible. And we just go with the flow and um, whatever people are needing from us. Um, I've been doing a lot of advising with groups who are trying to plan for summer programming. You know, some of the big service providers like Kamehameha schools, for example, they axed pretty much their entire um, summer enrichment program and now are in redesign. 
um, and trying to partner with people on island. And so it's just been scrambling and trying to figure out um, what do we need, who's already doing what, and what infrastructure is there, and trying to make the best of it. Awesome. Well, I know, you know, definitely proceeding with, with caution and, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty going on, even as we plan, right? And things have been scrapped, things have been changed, you know, obviously things might be hybrid, things might be totally virtual. Um, but I think it's, it's always good to kind of have that, that vision of what we want. And I, I agree, I, I want it to hopefully relatively soon get back to normal where I can shake somebody's hand and and give somebody aloha and love without them giving me, you know, like, oh, be careful, you know what I mean? Um, yeah, any other thoughts before we move on to the next question? I, I Yeah, I Kaimana, I, I do want to add one more thing. Uh, we've also spent a lot of time supporting families with developing their own activities and relationship with their kiki. So um, some of our, I guess, I don't want to say programming, but our messaging out to um, teachers like coming up with assignments or projects that encourage them to look within their own families, you gotta move. <laughs> um, look within their own families and start up conversations that they never have time for before and, um, or things, activities that they can do, um, together at home. So like, there's a lot of, of course, garden starting, um, you know, people taking up different hobbies, but, um, so a lot of classes in the community sector sort of is encouraging um, that kind of interactions at home, um, keeping people busy, but also connecting with the different members of the family. Right, even with our organization, um, because, you know, a lot of the kids were learning at home. Kankakai School is learning in school, but they, um, they don't let outside resources come in. And then they have like some kids at home learning, some kids in the school learning. So whatever we're offering to the schools, we try to make it family friendly and try to include the family and encourage the family to participate in whatever activity we're offering to the kids or, you know, our reading program, we made the books available in the school, but we encourage the children to take them home and, you know, read, read to the family or have the family read to them or they read to their siblings. But we really, um, just like Michaela said, we really try to um, encourage the family participation as well. Awesome. Well, thank you, folks. Um, just kind of a heads up, I'm probably going to ask a couple of more questions on my end and for any of you folks in the audience uh, attendees if you have questions yourselves uh, please feel free to write them in the Q&A and we'll get to them in the kind of the ending portion of our, our Palanoa or Kuka Kuka um, but I guess my next question kind of transitioning from COVID um, I would love to hear your folks's kind of journey to where where you are now I know that's kind of a loaded question and we can go on and on about this 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 topic, right? But, you know, Auntie Penny in your, in your bio, you credit great mentors and, and the Aina and a host of other things and Auntie Mikiala, right? You talk about the, the deep ancestry that you have to this place. And Uncle Kikama, of course, you talk about fam being very much family oriented and Aina oriented. Um, so I guess my question is, is how did you guys get to where you are today? Uh, and that could be, you know, educationally through school and it doesn't need to be through school. I mean, I'm just kind of throwing it out there. How did you folks end up where you guys are? Um, and you can start with whoever. I went first. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think for me, uh, where I'm at today is because of uh, my community, uh, because of my island, because of my friends. Um, you know, teachers like Eddie Penny, she's a, a big influence in my life. Um, she, you know, took the time to to coach us canoe paddling when nobody else wanted to coach us. And she would show up at 5.30 in the morning and, and all these knucklehead guys and she would coach us on this uh, old, old <laughs> bus up va that we had to tie together at the Ganos, <laughs> you know? Um, Stuff like that. I think those are are, are really um, big influences in my life. To you know that have gotten me. You know, aside from my parents and and my grandparents, 
but also a big credit to my community and, and my friends um, and teachers like Auntie Penny and, and others. And I think it really is true when they say it takes a community to raise a child because this community has definitely raised me. And um, I really feel like that. And I, I really feel like it's my obligation to, to give back because, you know, that's our kuleana. So that's my story in a nutshell. <laughs> Since the mic is on, I'll just flow from there. Then. Um, I gotta say that I started learning, turn over your hand. <laughs> but I started learning from my my family, my grandparents. My dad is like this dynamic, crazy guy. Um, I learned a lot about just staying alive from him. I'm the ninth child of ten, so by the time I roll around, he kind of got parenting figured out a little <laughs> bit better than the first couple ones. But definitely, um, he wasn't perfect. But um, that's okay. I learned so much from being part of a big extended family and then plugging into like Auntie Penny's family, the Rollinses and then the Helms. I mean, you just get like these big, huge families and you never really felt um, separate. Like really my, my nuclear family is really small um, when you look at the bigger families on the island, but we, they're so inclusive and everybody just kind of like invites you over to all the big events. And so I think Part of that, like knowing that I was always, I always had a place I was going to call home and no matter where I, I could go anywhere in the world, I could come back. And I think that really lent to all of us having um, a sense of adventure like and our connections to the canoe and, and voyaging and just traveling. Like we always knew we wanted to go like share our, you know, and just get out there and see and do for yourself. Um, and that's how you're going to know for real, um, but come back, you know, and there's always a, you get to come back. Um, so I went away in uh, eighth grade. I went to school on Oahu. I went to a boarding school and it was something that so many people in my family had done. Um, but from there, I had an opportunity to be an exchange student in Rarotonga in the Cook Islands. So I spent my junior year in high school studying abroad. And that to me was one of the biggest um, eye-opening experiences. Tiny island, one-tenth the size of Molokai. So if I thought Molokai was small, you get over there, it was even more small, but they have way more people. And so many things were the same, and yet so many things were different. And to me, like stepping back away from my island and my community, having this different lens helped me to come back and see where um, just how things could be different or like or like look at I guess enjoying multiple perspectives and I think you know I went on I went to college it took me 20 years to get my bachelor's because I wanted to have kids and do all this other crazy stuff and I'm actually in my master's program right now I'll go finish up uh this summer um so singing in Hawaiian language and um my master's is in education curriculum studies um but really it was like now I went to school just because I like one degree so that I can get one better paying job because I do a lot of work, but I don't have a something to show for it. So I have to go backwards. Like I really just getting this degree to validate what everybody in my community has spent 20 something years teaching me um, as professionally. And it's kind of cool to like validate all my teachers, all my mentors, all my auntie pennies and uncle mokes and um Mrs. Tamura's and I mean, everybody in my <laughs> education genealogy, um, they've all contributed to this. Um, and even my children as teachers, and now I have Mo'opuna as my teachers and uh, all my students, there's just this legacy of um, aloha aina, yeah, our, our aloha and our compassion and our, our responsibility to our island, it's embedded in everything we do. And like everything, what are you talking science, you're talking art, whatever, there is a sense of aloha for Molokai that is so um, profound and prominent, like very few places, like I spend time working in other communities or like on Oahu, for example, not to pick on them, but 
very few people love Oahu the way Molokai love Molokai. Like we love Molokai and you can take one Molokai and put them anywhere in Vegas, in Germany, whatever. That you go fight, like they love Molokai and then they're not afraid to tell everybody. And I hope they like, they never ever lose that. Like, and even, and we see it. We see people who Molokai who have moved away and they're raising their families elsewhere. And you know what? Their kids, they, still, they love Molokai too. And, <laughs> and we see that. And I think there's so many Pacific Islanders out there now. Yeah, you, you in living wherever you are for whatever reason. And, but you still love your home, your Onehana or your, your homeland, your Kulaivi, where your family from, where your parents are from. And that passion, like, don't ever let that go. Um, and you can take your Kulaivi with you. Um, and when it's a part of you, because it really is, like when your parents have eaten of that dirt and of that ocean and all that salt and all that good, yummy nutrients and every all that mana that has come out of the aina, most of you were made from that energy, you know? And so it's in our DNA. And no matter where you go in the world, um, that's a part of you. And I hope everybody get one chance to come back to their motherlands at some point in life, even if just for a visit, stay connected. But that's kind of how I wound up being this. I love to travel. I've taken students um, many times to Aotearoa and to Rarotonga um, in particular because I've had really good relationships and have Hanai family there to have that experience so that Molokai Opio youth can step out and engage with these other communities and then see that perspective of their home um, from that outside lens a little bit, but still familiar enough that there's relevance. And, and then they start coming up with these other ideas of how they gonna contribute to making this place better for themselves. Okay, so I think just um, my journey, you know, born and raised on Molokai into a family that has been here forever. I mean, we go back all the way to Kayakea and beyond that. And um, my my family, my mom had seven brothers and one sister, and only her sister had moved away actually. And she had a brother, a couple of brothers in Hilo, but most of her family was here on Molokai. And my mom raised us as a single parent. And so, talk, you know, Kikama mentioned being raised by the village. Everybody didn't raise Mary's kids, you know. <laughs> Everybody was there to help my mom. But um, in my life, the women were good role models. They were strong. My, my grandmother, my grandfather died before my grandmother. And my, my grandmother held it together. And then, you know, my mom, single parent, you know, it'd be raining outside, pouring the roof leak. She, I remember her going outside the hammer and the shingles, you know, go fix the roof, not scared of going. So she showed me, hey, you can do it, you know, not, not scared, do them. And education was like a big deal with her. And for Christmas, I can remember she bought us these fabulous books, beautifully illustrated, wonderful stories, uh, you know, and we could dream with these books and, um, and she, you know, I went to the same school, Mikiala went, and my, I never let go. My mom pushed me to go. You take that test, you try again, you're going, you know, and I didn't want to disappoint her. I loved her so much, and she worked so hard for us. I didn't want to disappoint her, and, and eventually I did go on my freshman year, and I stayed there for four years. And then I had really good mentors at Kamehameha. And one of them, I remember, is Willie Chai. He took me under his wing, and he called me in his office one day. He goes, eh. I see that you didn't apply to college. And I'm like, college? Mary Kimball's daughter can go to college, you know? Like, we're so poor. I mean, you know, I this is big for me to come to come here. Man, how am I going to college? He goes, you can go. And I want you to apply. So I applied to one college, Hastings College, and, I, and they accepted me. And next thing I knew, I was packing it up, going to the middle of the United States. <laughs> and here I was at Hastings College. And then, again, I was very fortunate to have good people and i did stray a little bit with the the rock and roll and everything else but um eventually came back to molokai and then you know met hokulea and that that was a whole nother thing that influenced my life um and so i i think you know my journey i have just been fortunate to meet up with really i've been blessed to have a really good family and really good people that care and took the time 
to help me um, on my path and to, you know, to show me the way. And that's why, you know, Kikama, I, th I thank you for that. I, you know, that was so fun coaching you guys. And, and you know, I said yes because I remember my uncle them saying yes to me, you know, when I wanted to learn. And I think we need to do that. And my, my philosophy is if you can, then, then you go do them. You know what I mean? Don't just say no because it's a hardship for you or you know, like. I really never like wake up 5.30 in the morning. But if that's when you guys could paddle and you guys wanted to learn so much, yeah, I go do them because I can and because we should. And um, yeah, so I think that, um, you know, my husband and they joke, my, even my son, they joke about it all the time. They go, you know, mom, have you been practicing? I go, practice what? Remember, you're supposed to go in the front of the mirror and say, no, see how the lips are formed, no. And that's always been hard for me to say no, especially when I know that I can, you know, because people in my life has always said yes to me and helped me along my way. And I feel like I need to push it forward and help as much as I can. Hello, you folks, for sharing, you know, your experiences and your journey. Um, wow, just a lot of things. I mean, the, the idea that this community fosters and, and raises you, I think that's a huge thing. Even for me, you know, I, I haven't spent my whole life here, but I spent a good portion of it. And I, I can attest to that, you know, there's something very special about this place and the, the people and the way that it uplifts you. And, and like Auntie Penny said, it shows you that you can, right? Um, and, and oftentimes when I think about how I left to the mainland for school, it, it solidified that. It, it, it allowed me to realize a lot of these things. Um, but, you know, I, I, moving on to the next question, I, I, I wanted to get to this question because, um, you know, I think this is a lot of what, uh, what some of our audience members want to hear. Um, and that's some of your folks' involvement with the Va'a community and with Hokulea, right? And, you know, obviously Hokulea was kind of this beacon, not just for Native Hawaiians, but for, you know, Pacific Islanders and Indigenous people around the world, right? Um, and it, it's, it's renowned for its, you know, the journey and the, the revival of culture and practices and, and showing society that, you know, says that we can't do certain things, that we can do certain things, yeah? So I guess my question is, is how have you folks, how would, how would you, how are you folks involved with the Vaal community and with Hokulea and, and I guess your journey into that? Um, I, um, I had come home from college, I've been living on Molokai and I, and I heard about the Vaa, but you know, that was in the news and it was being built on Oahu and, um, you know, you go, oh, cool, they're going to build this canoe and I'd like to see it, you know. I hadn't, I, I was so naive of how the Polynesians had arrived here. I know, I knew more about Lewis and Clark and the pioneers and um, the settlement of the, well, I'm being nice when I say settlement of the United States, but um, <laughs> yeah, I knew more about that. That's what they taught you in school. They taught you American history and they didn't teach you about your own history about where you, your Polynesian ancestors came from and stuff. So I did, I was really naive of all of that. And, um, but you know, we had always, our family has always been a canoe family. When we were little, we built our little tin pans, you know, out of the old corrugated iron and got scrap wood and made our paddles out of wood. And we always had little, our own little canoe races in front here. And then later on, you know, went to the canoe clubs and paddled on the, the bigger canoes and stuff. So we've always had, that canoe influence in our family. I was always passionate about canoes, but um, I didn't know about the Va'akalua and the Polynesian migration and all of that. And so, but like I said, I was, you know, reading about it in the paper, hearing about it in the news. Um, when Hokulea came into our harbor, it was, it was um, stunning. It was amazed balls. I mean, like it stopped my car. I had to stop and like, whoa, now that is a canoe, you know? And she just radiated mana. Like she, she like 
she went kahea you in a big way and i was just like holy smokes i i want to know more about this i want to like be a part of this i gotta i gotta touch the canoe like you know it was just so um overwhelming but still even at that moment it wasn't like i like go i like go on this journey i want to be a part of this it was um it was just that i wanted to know that canoe but I never even dreamed that I could make the voyage. And then fortunately for me, I was asked to do the first voyage in 1976. And I was able to sail home from Tahiti on Hukulea. And yeah, it was big. It was epic in, in every way that you can imagine. And today, it has stayed at me for the, you know, this year we celebrate our 45 years for that journey. And it, it, it opened so many doors for me. It opened my eyes first. And then it opened so many doors for me and it just strengthened me and um, helped me to do, to raise my family, to do my work, to Malama, Aina, everything. It, it literally changed my life. Oh, Mahana Dupeni. Um, you know, I think we were introduced to the Va'akaloa when we were in elementary school. Hokole would come um, every once in a while and, and park down at the harbor, but um, never really um, thought, you know, I was going to be a part of the crew until uh, and Penny and Uncle Mel had um, asked if I wanted to, because I was home um, going to school on the island and uh, Uncle Mel Pa'oa and Auntie Penny had asked if I wanted to be practice for part of the, uh, be part of the voyage to Rapa Nui. And, and I started, I said, yeah, sure. So I started training and met a lot of really, really, really good people um, that I call Ohana. And eventually made it onto my first deep sea voyage in uh, June of 1999. And we went to the Marquesas and been part of the Ohana Va'a ever since. I did another uh, deep sea voyage in um, the past worldwide voyage. Uh, was able to bring Hokuleo home from Rapa Nui. Um, it just connected me to not just our Ohana Va'a in Hawaii, but it also rebuilt those bridges to our Polynesian brothers and sisters. Um, when, we, when I came back into the Marquesas uh, this last go round, it was like coming home. And when we, when we pulled into Tahiti again, it was like coming home. And I really feel strongly that, that our Polynesian nation, you know, the thing that connects us is the va'a and, and the canoe. And we're all connected that way. And my family is not just my nuclear family now. It's not just my community on island. It's not just my really good friends. It's not just my friends in the state, but it's also throughout yeah, wherever, wherever Hokulea has gone, <laughs> the Ohana Va, your family just got bigger right now. Now we went throughout the world. So we, we get Ohana in whew, Africa to Hawaii everywhere and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. In New York, any kind. Yeah. yeah. But I, I got to say, too, that um, more importantly than the voyage itself, and I say this truthfully, and I really sincerely mean it, were the lessons that I learned on the va'a. Hemoku he va'a he va'a hemoku. The lessons I learned on the va'a has become the most important teaching tool for me when I teach Keiki about living on these islands and malama aina. And, I, and it has been my, my, I feel like my kuleana to um, share these lessons learned and push them forward so that the keiki can use those lessons as a tool as well to malama aina, yeah? 
I, I gotta agree with Penny. I mean, the canoe is, you know, what, 60 feet long by so many feet wide, and that's your island, right? And when you're living on your island and, you, you know, your, your crew is your community, and you got to learn how to live together. Yeah. Critical. Very critical. Um, you got to learn how to live together. And, you know, that's where you, you really think about each other, your resources and, and everything. So I, I got to agree. You know, that's probably the most important thing. Uh, high level takeaway. <laughs> Yeah. Um, right. And when Uncle Mel and I were looking at inviting people in, you know, one of the thoughts that came to us was, will this person, you know, take these lessons learned when they come back and, and utilize them and not pull hole? You know, we didn't want them to pull hole that experience or, or just think of it as an as adventure. Oh, I'm going to sail, you know, and just this big adventure. And then, Paul, we really wanted to look at people that we thought would would come home and share that those lessons learned and take that experience further into the community and i gotta say that yes kikama miki ala you know all of our ohana va'a they've done exactly that i think yeah and it's challenging because on our island itself we don't have a, a va'akaulua for us to sail so we always got a hui up and jump on everybody else's canoe and go uh, practice and train with them. But then we realize that there's a lot of things that we can do on island, like before you even get on the va'a, yeah, before you even get, kind of like any other sport, yeah, before you hit the court, you better be in the gym, you better be on the track, you got to run, build up your cardio, you got, there's so many um, basic skills, yeah, before you learn the hula, you better learn your, your helas and wehes and kaholo for days, you know, like you have to build up uh, all these other core uh, skills. And for me, I'm, I'm not, I can sail very limitedly. I've done overnighters. I've done into island. I will not go farther than that. <laughs> I have land crew all the way. Ask me for sand, ask me for pack stuff, inventory, fix stuff, do night watches in the harbor. Yes, I'm your girl. I, 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 I it's one of those things like it looks very, um, it's really exciting and you want to, and when you're maybe like the first six hours, it's super fun. And then the next six hours, you're like, okay, <laughs> I really forget. <laughs> and so I don't, there's certain sensations on the, on the canoe that I cannot handle. It makes me sick. Just, it's just the way I built. Um, and then other things I'm like, woohoo. Yeah, I can handle this. So if I'm out and standing fine, like the, slow moving rocking thing not my not my action but my job then becomes um preparing everybody else who might we got to pretend look for the potential and look for the one who might be the next great captain for us you know and it's one of those things it's so intimidating because hokule is like this rock star amazing you know and so many keiki you know would look at her and just feel like i would i could never you know i would never make crew and um, I got to say that through all the work of the Auntie Pennies and Uncle K Commons and all these other people, we have Kiki who are like intimately um, know this canoe now. Like they've, you know, spent time like there and knowing and just that curiosity and being able to come aboard and hang out and just um, pull down those barriers and staying connected through the whole worldwide voyage um, by through technology, being able to talk to the people on the canoe. And so, you know, throughout the worldwide voyage, you know, those three years, we had a number of Molokai people crew and it was keeping our community. So these keiki, these kids grew up three years of their life. Like they went to a different teacher and a different teacher and a different teacher. And they followed this canoe and they kept seeing their aunties and uncles on board. And they kept, you know, like um, just keep trying. And, and again, it's that thing like, wow, can if that can happen, what can I do? And they recognize that their potential and just as a lahui, as a, you know, as a community, like this is what we're capable of if we work together. Um, Hokulea has a, a companion, a sister, Hiki Analia. And when she, she was born in Aotearoa and I took my Molokai students, we went to Aotearoa to see her being built um, because we thought how, rare is it for us to have a canoe of this, you know, at this level be constructed. And we wanted to give her our mana and our aloha. So we went there. 
And the next time they saw that canoe, she came up for her maiden voyage and my husband sailed from uh, Hilo coming across, taking her to Oahu. But we were all standing on the backside of Molokai and watching her pass our island from the cliffs. And for our, our opio to be like, we saw her like thousands of miles away being born. And the next time there's Uncle Mel, there's, you know, Uncle Kyoki on the canoe and they're like waving at and just like that pride. And we're standing on this cliff and the ocean looks like crazy. It's just this huge um, expansive view. It just, it's just horizon to the north and this tiny little va'a is going by and you're on the top of this cliff and you're like, it's so close. It is literally so close to the island and it looks so small. And it clicked when we got to the worldwide voyage and we were watching my husband and Uncle Mount, the Molokai guys, uh, Mahinoho moving from Samoa Tonga, making the first really big um, run into New Zealand, into Aotearoa, crossing through Samoa Tonga, making that run and realizing how tiny that va'a is in the big wide ocean. And you're looking at the Google map and you're just like, the magnitude of that is like mind blowing. Um, backing up a little bit, I did take those, some of those same students and some other ones. We went to um, Rarotonga. Uh, so based off of my experiences, like I said, I would take Opio to go travel and go check out these other communities. So we were, we intentionally were um, there when Hokule and Hikianalia and Fafaite came into the Cook Islands. And so we were able to jump on the Marumaru Atua, which is the Cook Island Va'a, and sail out until we met the canoes on the water. And to, I cannot tell you how excited it was, exciting it was for us to like know that the two the three canoes had actually been through a number of storms it was really unexpected they were beat up we we had to medevac people off the canoe because they were sick and injured um they were battered they you know it they were suffering from hypothermia because we thought tropics not gonna have not gonna be that cold right okay we found out a whole lot of lessons we learned in that moment and if you can think of being when 16 year old and knowing that your aunties and uncles and people that you love and the late Ohu Coburns that you, I mean, all these friends and the people that you know were on this canoe sailing out and then seeing them appear this tiny little dot on the horizon and that dot getting closer and just tripping out on all the Polynesian Islanders that made up this crew that were welcoming. We had, you know, the Tahitians were escorting. We get into the Cook Islands. There's a whole way, you know, there's Maoris on board there. I mean, just like, and all of us just like united around this tradition and bringing all this wisdom from all these different peoples into this space, that appreciation, not just for each other in that moment, but ancestors for generations you know it's just like you part of something so magnificent um I wanted that for my for my youth and they certainly got that um even though they weren't crew members you know even though they're they got to be a part we trained with the Rarotongan went to school with them and learned all of their protocols for welcoming and they were included in this you know experience and just like Oh, this is how it used to be. Try to think about that. Like, you know, we see the footage of the uh, 76 voyage, the canoe coming into, Ohokulea coming into Tahiti and the like Jajillion people in the water. It's just like, how crazy is it to like be a part of that moment? I wanted that for our kids. So when my husband pulled into Aotearoa, you know, and we went through all those protocols, I wanted my own children to be there for those ceremonies and see that and witness it from the other side. Because when Auntie Penny came back, Auntie Penny only, can only tell us stories and we're trying to see pictures and she cannot articulate that feeling. Like it's so unreal, that feeling, right? And years later, like, we still ask Auntie, tell us the story about that you know, moment. And we don't get tired of hearing it. And so if we can include our OPO, you know, in as many moments like that as possible. I think that's how you keep the passion and the fire for these things alive because we can watch the video, but again, um, until you smell it, taste it, feel it in your, on your skin and in your bones, like 
that's when you really know things. And so the more opportunity, even moving forward to create these authentic experiences and including, sometimes we think like, oh, we'll leave the kids home. <laughs> like they're gonna be noisy or they're gonna be, you know, distracting or whatever is in. Uh, a lot of times we exclude Keiki instead of teaching them how to behave in those spaces, how to mm -hmm. behave um, and be quiet and respectful and listen when the rest of the world is teaching them they don't have to behave that way. Um, you know, I know plenty of people like they don't take the kids out to eat dinner at restaurants. They say, oh, my kids not going to behave. Well, you got to start somewhere but because if you don't, then they don't know the, what's, oh, you know, what is what is the right way. So I, I'm from the opposite end, like keep bringing them, bring them to the va'a, even if just to put your hand on, on the hull and touch. You know, maybe you're not ready to get on board, but you know, you got to keep bringing them, bringing them, bringing them. And I think collectively, Penny K. Kama and I have created as many opportunities as possible. We, when Hokulea came back, we brought every sing, almost every single school child on the island to the canoe. Like we went man for like two weeks, can just like hundreds of kids in buses coming. Thousands, thousands. <laughs> <laughs> and it was crazy. And we was tired and we were saying the same thing over and over and over again. But you know what? It was worth it because today they know that, you know, like, they can say they know Hokulea, they touch Hokulea. And, and when they see all, uh, you know, they continue to see that Va'a moving around. They just know that, I don't know, like they met the celebrity in person. And more easy, it's easier to imagine themselves one day being a part of the next voyage. Because she got so many more voyages up ahead of her. And we're excited for the next generation. Come on, I know we're getting to that time, but I just want to say a couple of things. I, I was glad that Kai... Um, Kekama mentioned about feeling like you went home and when I was there that big reception that Michaela talked about even though I did the voyage back we were there to greet the crew that sailed to Tahiti and it was such an incredible moment but I think what stood out for me above everything else was the Tahitian saying welcome home welcome home what took you so long to come back and um and I was like, there was a moment for me, I was like, oh my God, this is where we're from, you know, this is who we are, we are part of all these people. It was an incredible, like, moment for me, aha. Uh -huh. And then the other thing, Michaela, when you talked about how you don't want to do a long voyage, but you're happy to sand or whatever, and I, the, I emphasize to the kids all the time that um, the land cruise is important as the the, the ones that had the opportunity to go sail because without the land crew, we're nothing. We, we cannot do them. And, and, you know, I started out as land crew and fortunately got selected to be ocean crew. So, and even though I only have done since that one sail, like little inter-island sails and, um, you know, I didn't ever do a long voyage again, but I still consider myself a part of the crew. And I think once you're a crew, you're crew forever, whether you're land crew or you know, if you did a long voyage or, you know, sailed um, that distance, it doesn't matter. You you put your mana into that canoe and it's all important. There was there was a huge, you know, you see the, the faces of the ones that sailed to Tahiti and our faces that sailed back. What you don't see is that army that was behind us doing all that work to get us ready and making it happen for us. And I think of all those people like Rido Bowman and the Foresights and, um, you know, Will Kasaka, all those guys. And I'm so grateful every day for them, every day. And I'll never forget them, ever. So I think that's important for the kids to know that everybody brings their own strength to the canoe. And, and that strength is important it's needed it's important and we need to recognize that awesome well thank you folks so much um we're gonna i'm gonna combine the the two audience questions that i have from uh dr kehalani van and also from moana um because i think they kind of speak to a similar thing um they both thank you for the ike and the mana'o that you folks have shared and the touching and sharing uh you know the experience that you have have shared with this community right um, and their questions kind of go along the lines of this, um, you know, Dr. Vaughn talks about how, you know, a lot of Hawaiians are um, living off island 
um, and she wonders kind of how can they fulfill their kuleana while they're away. And similarly, Moana talks about how she's you know raising young Tongan children and and um, in the diaspora away from home. And her question is along the sa same lines, like how um, can uh, what are your suggestions in in uh, staying connected to their your ancestral land and knowledge and mana? Um, so if you folks maybe could answer that uh, in just a couple of sentences or um, in the in the last five minutes or so that we have, that would be awesome. Okay, I want to jump on this real quick because I think one of the greatest things that our ancestors left for us are the Hawaiian values, the values of kuleana, of kokua, of um, pa'ahana, um, all of those great values that shape us and, and guide us. And I think it, no matter where you live, whether you live in Hawaii or you live away from Hawaii, those values are in you. And you can practice those values, whether you live here or whether you live in New York or Utah or Nebraska or whatever. And if you have those values with you and you keep those values alive and you practice those values, then you are connected. That you will, um, you will, um, you can, if you Hawaiian, you Hawaiian, whether you're living in Molokai or in Utah, right? If you have, I think if you have those values, then then that's that's the greatest legacy that our ancestors gave us. And those values can be practiced no matter where you are. And that will keep you connected to your um, to your Polynesia or and to your Aina and to your to your families. Yeah, Mahalo Iti Penny. I think you know, ditto to that, you, you know, the values left behind. Um, no matter where we are, I think we can also do practices that help us practice those values. Um, you know, if I was living in, in Utah, I probably would be doing one emu every month or something and, and feeding the, the, the ohanas up there just, just so that we can get together and talk about home and, and play music and, and be connected, yeah? So I, I think, you know, those traditions uh, that we do back home a lot of those traditions can still be done no matter where you at. Um, music, hula, uh, luau, paina, all those kind of things, you know. And then those those core values that you teach at home can still be taught no matter where you at, like Auntie Penny said, and can be reinforced by those practices that we still can do up there. And then also with technology, you know, you can also keep your kids in touch with home. Yeah. Whether it be zooming family back in Tonga or Samoa or 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 Aotearoa or Hawaii, you know, and and keep them in touch with their kupuna and and their communities outside of of the what do you call it the di diaspora or you know yeah so the the other thing too is be proud of who you are be proud of you Polynesian. be proud of um we come from and i think you need to teach your 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 families and your that we come from a proud people a great nation skilled people um people that are taking intellect to a, a high level you know we have to celebrate that and who we are and we need to celebrate it with our families and let them know where they come from so that they're always proud about where they come from and they they strive to be like those people those proud people those skilled people those brave people those those highly intellectual people you know that they strive to be like them and they're not going to strive to be that way if they don't know, they don't know those people and they don't know where they come from. We need to let them know, hey, you got to be proud of who you are and the people that you come from. I know sometimes it's a struggle to be so intentional. Like I say that because like people who grew up on Molokai, they don't really think about having to be Hawaiian. They just are. Um, they just, I mean, it's like, they just live normal and then they see the uh, commercials on TV and they're like, oh, that's what Hawaiians look like. <laughs> and then when you take on Molokai and you put them in the city and they're on Oahu, all of us, all the Oahu people go, ooh, like, oh, you guys so Hawaiian. And you're like, well, why you say that? And they're like, I don't know. You guys just so, you guys different. And we're like, how are we different? Like, we don't think we're doing anything different, but I was just like, 
recently uh, somebody some guy in a store was talking to himself and I went answer him uh you know I was passing by and you don't answer I went help him out and he went look at me and he said you from Molokai and I said yeah and I get my mask on everything yeah and I was like yeah and he was like only one Molokaian would stop and help somebody one stranger in the store like this he was like the only time people any had ever done that have been Molokaian so he was just like oh and I thought, oh, that's so crazy that we can get picked out of the crowd like that. Okay, well, um, so kind of addressing that. One, hang on to language. Um, anytime you get a chance to use your, your words, you know, with your kids, do so. Um, you know, just small kind of vocabulary because there's such a mana in, in our olelo, in our languages. Um, share stories. Um, put on the music. I tell you, music is so... I wish every... A uh, school bus in Hawaii played Hawaiian music on the way to school because I think Hawaiian music put people in a good mood. And if all the kids just had to get brainwashed with Hawaiian music on their way to school, they might be in a better attitude than some of this rap music or whatever that kind of music be feeding them. No, for real, music really informs our consciousness. So if you surround your children with messages of positivity and appreciation for the landscape and for people. And I mean, really Hawaiian music praises all the best things of us, you know, and even some of the ugly stuff is like kind of hidden and kolohe, but hey, even that, that poetry is important. So just getting their ears to hear the voices of the ancestors. So when the, the ancestors start talking to them, guess what? They're more likely to recognize that communication. So when our ancestors talk to us in our dreams or they showing up on the landscape or whatever, they, that's how they're going to know. Like if the someone kiki, you know, here's someone, when somebody's speaking someone, they're going to be like, oh, that's not someone over there. Hawaiians is the same way. Like if we don't train them to recognize it, they won't. Of course, mana is in the food. Sometimes we think, oh, we don't have the same ingredients um, available, you know, where we are. And so we miss the food from back home. And it gets, nowadays, they can curry or anything. Like they'll deliver it to your door. Like, Figure it out. And even if you got to save up and treat yourself once a month, you're going to order that something special from whatever is that soul food. I mean, it's called that for a reason. It really connects our DNA with something that resonates because our plants and animals are our ancestors. So when we partake of that, it's like we, we recharge the battery, the battery pack inside of us. We get excited for that. Yes, mana is in the food. Eat it. Like, and I tell you that joy and aloe, it sometimes it's just enough to carry us through to that get through whatever this next phase in life that is keeping us from the rest of the things that um, help us stay connected. You know, and of course, find your community. No, like now you get Zoom, call people up, you know, even um, I don't know if you guys get Clubhouse now. That's a new app on iPhones where you can talk to other people. We've been setting up these little rooms. Yeah, people from all over the world, just for Olelo Hawaii. You jump in, you can talk story, and no matter what level you at, and we play games. And um, I mean, people are hungry for connection nowadays, especially, right? So we got to get real creative in that space. So trying to honor the time that you had set, but that's just some ideas of ways you can, and read, 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 read stories to your kids every night, make it a practice where you can like start your day with one olelo no eao or one vocabulary word. And you're like, okay, gang, this is our word for the day. We're going to try to use them three times each in a sentence, you know, and get them to use it. And at the end of the day, read one, one story, story, you know, story. can, can be in English. I mean, but read the stories of the homelands, you know, and really get them to recognize those heroes and celebrate those heroes. Because I tell you, all those stories, they've been perpetuated for a reason. There's a moral, there's a lesson for us to learn, and they're very relevant and applicable today. And so sometimes we think, oh, that's just one myth or one legend, you know, we dismiss it as not having value. You're wrong. There is so much richness and wisdom locked in those mo'olelo that we have to keep them alive. And I tell you, some of the most informative um, lesson, life lessons have come to me through these stories. It teaches me how to be a good citizen, a good parent, a good Wahine, tons of stuff in there. So look there first. And that's way better than them being informed by, I don't know, some of this rubbish stuff. Even Disney is kind of going off base nowadays. Like, really, you guys, I, I looked at TV. I just, I can't handle it. I don't can even watch TV because it's just full of rubbish. Like, I'm sorry. So anyways, go out, make good content and make good choices. Not, not abandon the ancestors, man. They're there for you. They're timeless. 
Well, awesome. Thank you so much. Mahalo nui lo, and thank you all of you folks for, for joining us today. I know I reached out, it was like, almost seems like a year ago, not even a year, but it was a long time ago, right? I, I, we got in contact with one another and planned this thing. And I'm so thankful that you folks, you know, were able to hop on and, you know, share your mana'o, your ike, your experiences and help bridge these two communities, right? Our community here and the one that's being established at the U for Pacific Islanders and those who, who want to focus in the academic realm on that type of stuff. Um, so um, thank you for all of our attendees and, and uh, panelists for showing up today and, and tuning in. Um, again, thank you, Uncle Kikama. Thank you, Auntie Mikiala. Thank you, Auntie Penny, for, for again, sharing your mana'o. Um, and then just a quick little plug. Um, uh, if you are interested, uh, if you're an undergraduate or, or a potential undergraduate at the U, um, please apply to the Pacifica Scholars Summer Institute. The application is due on May 28th. Um, if you know anybody in our community as well, Uncle Kama, Auntie Fanny, Auntie Mikiala, who may be interested in attending the U, uh, let them know. This, this is an opportunity and option. Um, but again, thank you folks. And, and um, you know, I hope that uh, all of you have a great rest of your day. Mahalo, ahuyo. Hi, Kamana. <laughs> We hope right on it, Penny. Nikola, baby, oh no, no. I'm so glad my husband took out the play to and the play is ready. Now I'm on for Hawaiian food. <laughs> and come on, I did want to tell you that Molokai was the best place to be during COVID because I actually went gain weight because <laughs> I had so many good resources and everybody was sharing all their, you know, Aina Momona. It was like, yeah, this is the best place to be. Yeah, I agree. So thankful to be here during this time. Thank you, Kaimana, for doing this. And for thinking of us. And for thinking of us. Yes, thank you, thank you to all of you to, um, for giving us this opportunity to, to share and then to, to meet you guys and be with everybody today. Yeah. Mahalo, you guys. Kale, Mona. Ahoy ho. Mahalo nui loa to all of our contributors, specifically our bridge team, School of Transform, Education, Culture, and Society, and Dr. Kehalan Ivan. Remember to join us every other Friday evening as we talanoa with Pacifica scholars, staff, and community leaders. Make sure to like, subscribe, and follow us on Instagram at U of U Pacifica Scholars and our YouTube channel, The Pacifica Archive. Till next time, ahui ho.